Uh, we've spent the last three days doing a really deep dive into some of the complex data types we've been generating. And so day four is dedicated to data analysis, how we analyze and statistically analyze and visualize all the complex data we've been generating. So we have a great lineup of talks for you today with Kelly, David, Lisa, Rachel. So I will not spend any more time. Please take it away, Kelly. Thanks, Leanne. Get the slides up here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Just want to confirm you can see slides. Yes, looks good. Great, thanks. All right, so um, I'll just show you our photos here. So you've got some faces for names. Um, Leanne said you'll hear from Lisa, who you also heard from on day one. David, who gave a talk on day two, Rachel and myself. And just as a quick uh, recap for um, days one through three, um, you should have heard about the experimental design, some uh, sample collection, about the instrument runs and molecule identification. And throughout this week, we've been using an example data set from the Agile Biofoundry and this table at the bottom is just a summary of the four different strains that were part of that experiment. And for our purposes um, as statisticians and data scientists, what we're going to be interested in at the end of the day is comparing each of these strains, two, three, and four, back to the um, base strain one to see what, um, what biomolecules are um, Differential, differentially expressed or present between the different genotypes. So there'll be three talks today, and our goal is to give you an overview of the general workflow that we would typically, typically go through with metabolomics and proteomics data. And we've got a bunch of examples um, showing figures from different analyses that we've done to highlight some of the things that you might see or that you should expect to see and then also things that are odd and indicate that a little bit more care is required. And we'll also be providing some motivation behind each of the processing steps. So we'll pause throughout our talks to give opportunities for questions, but please feel free to enter them in the chat here or in Discord and we'll be sure to get those answered for you. So this first talk, we're gonna talk through some data formatting, pre-processing, quality control, and filtering, and then normalization. And to begin, uh, for proteomics data, we have a choice of whether we wanna start at the peptide level or at the protein level. And MaxQuant and other softwares can provide protein level data. Um, it's not always clear what that process is, so I've just pasted in the description from MaxQuant um, if, if you're interested in that. Um, but also if you have protein isoforms in your data, then you'll need to use a method that can help account for those. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on today. For our purposes, we, we typically prefer to start at the peptide level with data for our proteomics analyses. With proteomics data in particular, there are a number of challenges that are important to be aware of and keep in mind because they'll impact the choices that we make throughout our analyses. So we have, um, oops, um, just as a reminder, we're working with relative uh, quantification data. So we can't just out of the box make comparisons between samples. We're also doing bottom-up proteomics. So we're starting with measurements at the peptide level and then rolling up to proteins. And for proteomics, there's, for unlabeled proteomics, there's often a lot of missing data. And then on top of all of these fun data challenges, there's also just the complexities of biology that play a role too. There are a lot of, analysis tools available that you can use to 
to analyze your data. These are often specific to one data type. So there might be a tool like Metabo Analyst that's specific for metabolomics or other tools that are very tailored to proteomics. And a lot of these tools require imputation. This is tricky because unlabeled proteomics data usually has between 20 to 50% or sometimes more missing values due to various random and non-random processes. And so imputation can have a big impact on downstream analyses. And these tools can be um, kind of black, spot, black box tools or have some unguided choices that the user is responsible for making. And so without being an expert and really understanding each of the choices and their implications, um, it, it's possible to end up with unintended consequences in your downstream analyses and in the statistical comparisons that you end up making. So this is, this is a screenshot of the first of many sets of choices um, in the Metabo Analyst tool. And it, it takes quite a bit of effort to go through and understand what each choice means and how it can impact your analyses. So in response to that, and also because um, myself and my colleagues are statisticians and we program in R, we've developed an R package that has helped us streamline our own data processing, processing and the exploration, quality control, and all of the statistical analyses that we do here with collaborators at PNNL and outside of the lab. And this package has methods that are robust to missing data. So we don't require imputation and it is um, applicable for lots of different data types. So the way that we've written this is that it can handle label free and isobaric labeled proteomics data at either the peptide or the protein level. Uh, metabolomics data that comes from NMR or mass spec, lipidomics data, and we're currently working on expanding this to transcriptomics as well. Uh, these links can take you to either the R package or also we have a, a shiny app, a user interface, so that without having to do any of the R programming, you can access all of these tools and go through a, work, a workflow. And we have a new um, release coming next month. So to start our workflow, um, we we get data. So at the end of yesterday, um, hopefully you have a really nice understanding of where the sort of crosstab spreadsheet data comes from and how to get to that point. So that's where we start. And we have two or three different pieces of information. We have quantified peptide or metabolite level data, the sample IDs, and I'll show some examples here on the next couple of slides. Um, using the BioFoundry data set. We have a mapping of peptides to proteins um, if we're working with proteomics data, or if we have metabolomics data, we might have a mapping between different identifiers. Um, and then we also need a mapping of the sample IDs from that quantified peptide or metabolite data file to the experimental groups that are of interest in any other sample metadata. And I'll point out too that on a lot of these slides at the bottom, um, there are in this other font here, there are the function names of the relevant PMART R functions that would be used for the different steps. So that if you are referring back to the slides later and wanting to program in R, you kind of have a guide to match up the, the steps to the functions that you can use. So this screenshot shows the um, proteomics data and I've circled at the top, uh, the peptide sequence column, the column with the protein mapping to each of those peptides, and then the sample names across the top and the rest of those column headers. And those sample names match exactly to this sample ID column that is circled on this slide. And those samples are mapped to the strains in column F. So here I'll pause briefly for questions and I'll ask our moderators to, 
to chime in since I can't monitor the, the chat right now. Do we have any questions at this point, Rachel? There's a couple. Okay. Um, there was a, a question about what does it mean for uh, being below the limit of detection as the most recent one. We had one about what missing data actually looks like in PMRR. We've got a couple in the Discord as well, but might want to start there. I think those are more PMRR processing related. Okay. Well, I'll just go back quickly to this um, quantified the peptide file here. So you can see that some of the values in the middle of this table are zeros. So those are the um, missing values or the values where no, none of that peptide was detected in the sample. So depending on the software that you're using to obtain this spreadsheet, it might be represented as zeros or NAs or NANs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit as we go forward about processing steps and how we represent that um, in PMART R. And then also we'll talk a little bit about imputation next. So hopefully that'll address those questions. Yeah, I think there's a, a little bit of a few questions about this missing data and confusion about it. It, it largely is a, a limit of detection issue in mass spec. So a zero means it wasn't observed. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. It may not have been there, but it may have been below the limit of detection. So we treat these zeros as missing data and it's, uh, they need to be treated very carefully as you will see through the rest of Kelly and Lisa's presentations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leanne. Were there other things in the Discord, Rachel? Um, there is a question here. When you're doing statistics for a multi-omic experiment, how similarly do you try to complete the statistics? Do you do the same things for the proteins as metabolites and transcriptomics data, or are you more focused on getting the best output for each individual experiment? That's a good question, yeah. Um, and I think we'll be able to address that a little bit more as we go, but we try to be consistent um, across the different data types, but there are certainly times where, you know, if, if there was, an issue with the, the instrument or processing of one sample for say metabolomics, um, then you might not have data for that sample for that, um, for that type of data, but maybe the proteomics data processing, you didn't have the same issue. So there are things like that that can come up um, that you, you don't have control over and you're just you're gonna do the best that you can um, to use to use all of the data. And um, when it comes to doing the actual statistical comparisons, you're probably going to be doing the same type of analysis on each data type, but some of the quality control can differ a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna keep going and then we'll pause again. So keep the questions coming, this is great. Uh, um, Kelly, sorry. Uh, there mm -hmm. is one question from Barbara that says, uh, we also talk about cleaning data prior to PMRDAR, such as looking for duplicate peaks. This is a common problem in our metabolomic data. So um, I figured that is more relevant right now. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, that happens before we would typically start the PMAR R workflow. Um, so I, I'm happy if someone else has, has something to chime in with on that, um, please do. But our usual workflow starts after that. Um, so I'm not sure if, if that was addressed at all yesterday or the day before.
I don't know if young Mo is on the call and had as a thought. Oh yeah, I I am looking at that question. So yeah, we in the data processing from our side, we remove the duplicate data. That's how we do before handing to data to the statisticians. Did you want to say anything about how you determine which peak to keep? That might be a loaded question. Yeah, but GCMS side, I think uh, we certainly distinguish the duplicated peaks, so we remove all of them. And then for LCMS side, I think uh, I think two tons of the duplicate. So maybe another similar spectra or kind of adduct like a sodium adduct or some potassium adduct or deprotonated or protonated. Like so, it it is some kind of a some manual creation for some data. However, if they behave similarly, then we can focus on them later. That's how we do, I think. Thanks, Young Mo. Yep. So when we looked at that um, cross tab, we saw some zeros um, in that that were non-detects. So whether or not the peptide was actually there. We treat it as it wasn't there since it wasn't detected um, at at least whatever the limit of detection is. Um, so the first thing that we do in our data processing processing is convert zeros, if that's how they're being represented in the data, to NA values. And that is so that the R code will recognize them as missing and not as a, a zero. And this plot is meant to illustrate the missingness. So on the y-axis, we see the percent of missing observations. And on the x, we have the mean log two abundance values. Um, the missingness is not just tied to the abundance value. We see high amounts of missing data for a wide range of the log two abundance values in this plot. And because of this, using something like half of the limit of detection as your imputation strategy isn't a good solution because it will introduce a lot of unrealistic values to your data set, especially when you have 20 to 50% of your values being missing with proteomics. Um, if you are in a situation though where you're doing classification or machine learning and can't have missing values in order to use that the algorithm that you're trying to implement, then the papers that are noted here on this slide can help with the choice of an imputation method. So I mentioned half the limit of detection um, as a common imputation method. Sometimes you see that missing data is represented as a zero um, or perhaps as the minimum value observed in your data set. Um, and these plots uh, show box plots for each sample in, in an experiment. And the two different colors represent two different groups of samples. And the plot on the left shows the log two abundance before any imputation. So if there are missing values, they're not being included in these box plots. The plot on the right shows um, a, a data set after imputation by one of these methods. And you can see that just the general structure of the box plots looks quite different than the ones on the left. And so this illustrates some of the unintentional changes that can happen by imputation. And as a last sort of cautionary example, um, this was a lung tissue study and the goal was to identify a subset of proteins that were predictive of age. 
And the imputation here was done with one of the top performing imputation methods. And then this subset of proteins was identified and found to be predictive of age. So there were 14 proteins that were um, selected. And upon further investigation, it was found that 12 of those 14 proteins that were identified as being highly predictive of age had more than 70% of their values imputed. So there was some sort of bias introduced into the data by imputing, and that is what was grabbed as um, for the proteins being predictive of age. So it just highlights the need to apply imputation carefully and not, not just blindly, even if you're using you know, the top imputation method, it can still have unintended consequences. You might not really want your predictive model to consist of that much imputed data. And at this point, I'll pause for questions and then I'm gonna hand it over to David to talk about some more quality control steps that we typically use. I have a feeling that there might be some questions about imputation. There are some questions. <laughs> um, let's see. In the Discord, there's a uh, question about the two, the twin box plots shown, asking a couple slides back, asking if the imputation is helping or hurting. But I do think um, this one doesn't have imputation, right? Am I correct this, in that? The or one on the, one on the right. Left, the one on the right does. The one on the right has in, imputed values, yes. Yeah, OK. The one left is not. And right. what you can see on the right is that the imputation val imputed values are fundamentally changing with the distribution of those box plot of your profile of abundances look like for each sample. You see that we get much heavier tails uh, at higher abundances because you've now packed a bunch of low abundance values into your data by doing imputation. So uh, to say helping or hurting, it's definitely, uh, it's hard to say, but what, it, what you can say is that it's fundamentally changing the structure of your data from what it was before imputation. There's also a question for a general explanation of what is imputation and there's some interest in if there is a best imputation or your recommendation imputation practices. So imputation is, in this case, you're trying to fill in missing values with a non-missing value based on properties of the data that's present. So depending on the imputation method, you would you can take into account different properties, right? So if we take one of the more, um, more basic methods, this half the limit of detection, you know what the limit of detection is for your instrument. And so that's sort of the information that you're using to, to fill in the missing values. Um, as far as selecting a method, I, I would point you back to these two reference, references because there are a lot of it depends. Um, and our standpoint is that if you don't have to impute, if you can use methods that don't require complete data, then that's preferable because there have been studies that show um, that imputation can cause a lot of problems. And Lisa, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Um, I would just say that, so from the plot on the top here, and Kelly's kind of mentioned it before, so there are a lot of things that can happen with mass spectrometry that cause you to get a missing value. One of those things is that your the instrument may not be able to detect the amount of uh, peptide that's there because it's so low in abundance. But uh, there are a lot of other things that can happen or properties of peptides that cause them not to be detected as well as others on, on the mass spec. So when you're talking about imputation, 
you would hope that you'd be looking at the data, that a method would look at the data and how things are co-vary together or, or correlated to one another and fill in reasonable values um, for what you might have observed. So, you know, as Kelly mentioned, one of these simple approaches is to just take half the limit of detection. That makes the assumption that all the missing data is missing because it's just very low in abundance. So, um, you, if you take a look at these two manuscripts that Kelly has here, you can see that that very naive approach performs very, very terribly. There are some other approaches that depending on how many samples you have, how many replicates, um, how much time you're willing to take, uh, computational time, that there are factors to consider that are discussed in those papers. But I will say if you're just looking for a blanket general the best types of imputation methods, um, the expectation maximization and random forest imputation methods tend to always kind of fall towards the top. But there are caveats on those that uh, would be useful to look at in those papers. My lights just turned off. <laughs> Okay. Were there other questions, Rachel, that we need to address right now? Um, let's see. There is the question, the practice of converting zeros and NAs to a very, very small number. And if that is a good practice, there is a couple more imputation things in the um, Discord here, but let me just look at them for a second. There's a lot of questions about best practices going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, the replacing with a very. Go ahead. Sorry, the replacing with a very small number. Um, I would put into the same category as when Lisa was talking about half the limit of detection, where you're assuming. You're making that same assumption that things are missing because they were present but not detectable. All right, I'm going to turn it over to David now and fix my lights so they don't keep going off. Oh, the joys of working in an office after it's been all alone throughout quarantine. <laughs> I don't even keep the lights on. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Are we all good to go? Yep, we can see the slides. Okay, thank you so much. Right. Well, as Kelly mentioned, I am David, and I'm going to be going over the rest of pre-processing and then some biomolecule filtering. So as we've mentioned with most omics data, you were working with relative quantities that have highly skewed distributions. This plot on the left here, you can really see that there's a large right skew. So in this case, this is each of the abundance values for each of the peptides plotted against each of the samples and you determine which group the samples belong to with that sample information file Kelly was talking about. So in this case, we've got nine replicates of this infection sample and three replicates of this mock sample. So since most downstream statistics assume normality, even PCA requires approximate normality, we log transform the data. It can be any log, it doesn't need to be log two, you can use log 10, you can use natural log, but we tend to use log two abundance because it's convenient when we're talking about log fold changes and that's commonly used in biological analyses downstream. And it's just in general, easier to see the distributions after you log transform it. So this is a much easier to read plot. Oh, we've shown you first how to properly format your multi-omics data files. We discussed the risks associated with imputing data, 
and interpretable transformations to the abundance data. So now I'm gonna go over filtering options for multi-omics data for quality control purposes. We're gonna start first with biomolecule filters. And I'll define what that means in the next slide. Outliers can affect downstream analyses. So part of the statistician or really any analyst job at this stage is to identify whether the outlier is a real signal, noise, or a loss of signal. And given the complexity of multi-omic data, there can be many different types of outliers. So we've designed filters that show where samples or biomolecules fall within these distributions so that users can make informed decisions in regard to removing outliers. So when I'm referring to a sample in the box plot before, I'm referring to where each of those box plots are. And then when I'm referring to a sample, I'm actually referring to a sample within the distribution, a biomolecule, excuse me, within the actual distribution. So filters typically fall into either of these categories and biomolecules, we're generally referring to peptides, proteins, metabolites, lipids, any of those that can be processed by the PMRDR package. So we're gonna, we'll be going through specific biomolecule filters first and when you should be using them. Oh, after peptide samples are matched to proteins with a database search tool, like in MaxQuant, we saw on Tuesday, you're gonna get a resulting table that looks like this. We've got a protein ID column here. We've got the actual uh, amino acid sequence listed here. This is just another output from MaxQuant, which has the previous and the next residue uh, for the sequence. And then all of these are the actual abundance values that were identified for that sequence. And if you look here, here's a nice example where this shorter amino acid sequence has more abundance than the larger one. Makes sense. And so uh, each of these columns is a sample. We've already converted our zeros to NAs at this stage. But if you look at the actual protein identification column, these are all been mapped to contaminants. And in this case, this TRYP is this trypsin. So these are proteins that have been um, snipped into uh, peptide sequences with trypsin. And so these matches, these sequences here are getting matched to this contaminant, which is not useful information for our analyses at this point. So you're going to want to remove all of these contaminants in your circle. You'll also notice with MaxQuant and sometimes with other top-down tools, you'll see um, pep, uh, protein names with XXX in front of them. That's not a real peptide sequence. That's a reversed peptide sequence that they use in false discovery rate calculations. So you're gonna to wanna to remove those as well. It's also important to note that a lot of softwares also filter out contaminants and these uh, reverse hits they just defined. So it's good to check that they're not in your data because if those come up as differentially expressed at the very end of the package, uh, that's not useful information. <laughs> Here's another biomolecule filter available in the PMRR package. And this is a biomolecule count filter, which will show you the number of times a biomolecule appears in each sample. So in this case, we've got 18 samples here. And across these 18 samples, we have 28,483 unique, in this case, peptides. Um, and so in two files, we have at least overlap of 25,364 metabolites or peptides in this case, as you uh, go down this plot. So if we set our threshold for this filter at two, this means that this, this number of molecules, so about 3,000 between these two uh, numbers of times the biomolecules appear across each sample. So these 3,000 unique, in this case, are one hit wonder biomolecules will be removed. And that makes sense because they're not going to be informative in our downstream statistical analysis because the goal is to understand the differential expression across groups. In that previous box plot, we had the infection group and the mock group. So we only have one time this sample ever shows up, or this, excuse me, molecule or biomolecule ever shows up, then that's not going to be informative in the, the downstream analysis. Also, as you have more replicates, in this case, we have eight, um, 18. 
replicates, you can be more stringent with this filter. Um, so those are all choices you can make. Another type of filter, we don't use this very often, but we always like to look at this distribution is called a coefficient of variation or CV filter. And the definition of this coefficient of variation is it's the standard deviation over the mean within each treatment group. So a very large CV would mean that the abundance distribution for that biomolecule has a very large standard deviation, which also won't be informative in downstream analysis. You can imagine a box plot with huge whiskers is not going to be, it's not going to be very easy to tell how that's different from another box plot. Um, so as you go to the right, you get wider and wider distributions of the whiskers from the box plot. And as you go to the left, you get narrower and narrower ones. So you want this distribution here of the smaller standard deviations for each of the biomolecules or peptides, metabolites, et cetera, depending on what you're looking at. The amount of variability that you see in the CV filter, um, in the CV distributions, it also varies depending on your sample type. So as we look here at this, filter, if at this distribution for the CV filter, it's very nice. There's no real need to filter out anything. Uh, we really only filter extremely egregious cases. And that's what this bottom it case is here. We've got CVs all the way above 300, which should definitely be filtered out because it won't come up as statistically significant downstream analysis. Once again, all of these filters should be thought of as used for your downstream analysis for your end goal. So ultimately, we want to make inferences about protein data so that we get higher competence data. So this first plot on the left, these are some protein peptide specific filters. So this is only for peptide and protein data. This shows on the left the number of peptides mapping to each protein. And we want cases where we've got more support or more confidence that that protein is actually in the sample. And what you do that with is more peptide evidence or pieces of that peptide that map to that longer, larger protein. So in this case, we've got 12,000 proteins are mapped by just a single peptide. So we're not highly confident that these are actual um, well-supported proteins in our data. So we might use the second or this third number to increase our confidence that that is actually a protein existent in the sample. Concurrently, we also want to remove peptides that are mapped or matched to multiple proteins because these are nonspecific. And I've got an example here. We've got peptide three, which is mapping to both protein A and protein B. These are nonspecific, also called redundant, and also called degenerate peptides. So in this case, we've got 50 peptides that are mapping to more than one protein. And so this is doing the opposite, which it's decreasing our confidence that these proteins actually exist because this peptide is mapping to uh, both of them. So in conclusion, you want more single mapping from the protein, uh, from the peptide to the protein, and you don't want that peptide to be mapping to multiple proteins. So this, this filter helps take care of both of those uh, situations. And these degenerate peptides I was mentioning, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more on the next slide. Oh, in this case, that is uh, right here, we've got this peptide piece here and it could be mapped or matched to either of these proteins. So if I gave you just this peptide and I also gave you this database right here of these two uh, proteins, would you be able to identify which protein that peptide came from solely based on the sequence? If you can, give us a call. Uh, otherwise, it's just better to remove these degenerate peptides because uh, we want to avoid decreasing confidence uh, that this, these proteins, um, that, that this peptide is decreasing the number of proteins that are mapped to it. So. There are cases, for example, in metaproteomics data from soil with many organisms, removing these redundant or degenerate peptides would cause you to lose huge amounts of your data. So in those cases, it's better to use an algorithm to try and identify um, the most likely protein or proteins that this peptide came from. 
And we will talk more about some of these algorithms when we discuss uh, proteoform identification later in the talk. And that's another case too. I, I wanna go back here and just point out that um, with that metaproteomics example I was talking about, you need to be careful with this peptide filter because um, we wouldn't suggest using it for metaproteomic data. Because in a soil sample, there are many organisms with many proteins and we oftentimes will not see more than one hit per protein. So you could filter out actual useful information um, in metaproteomics. Okay, so I've just wrapped up uh, discussing biomolecule filters you can use to clean up a data set. They remove rehearsed hit proteins, which are not true proteins. These filters will remove contaminants, one hit wonders, biomolecules with very large standard deviations that won't be, um, in, won't be, won't turn up significant downstream. And then um, it also removes degenerate peptides as we just talked about how that could be an issue. And there is a lot of data cleaning that goes on before we even get to the statistical analysis downstream, which should encourage you whenever you're doing statistics to always think about the data that's going into the analysis and whether what you're putting into a model, even something a simpler model like regression, you need to think about the data that's entering there and whether it's actually appropriate. So even after all these considerations for just biomolecule filtering, there's still more data properties that should be checked specifically if a sample itself is an outlier. And that's what Kelly will talk to you about. But before I pass it on to Kelly, I'm happy to answer any questions about biomolecule filters or, or pre-processing. So fire away, Rachel. All right. Well done, David. Uh, we had some questions in the chat kind of talking about, let's see, the most recent one, uh, handling degenerate peptides. Let's see. When handling degenerate peptides, can you see whether other peptides that match to candidate protein A could support assignment of the degenerate peptide to protein A over candidate protein B? So. Did you summarize that, my brain doesn't follow? <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, I, th I think these graphs don't actually display that, but it's asking if we, we can easily pull out um, which other peptides are also helping matching cut to the same thing as a degenerate peptide. See, so, that data is provided in these files here. So we've got protein and peptide matchings. So I don't know, I, Kelly or Lisa can say if there's a function in PMRR that does that, but it wouldn't be too difficult with some dplyr to pull out those cases. Yes. So, um, so I will say we're going to talk some about looking for proteoforms later with some algorithms that will um, we'll try to, well, as a secondhand benefit, we'll do some mapping of, of peptides to proteins. Um, and, and so, I don't know, Melanie, I would say maybe wait until then. And if your question still persists, feel free to ask again or ask in the breakout groups. Do we also remove low count biomolecules like some analysis and transcriptome do? So I think that refers to the biomolecule filter. Yeah, we, we tend to, um, that's what this filter here is, is doing is that we are removing these low count uh, biomolecules in, in this case. And, and it does vary. There's questions here about metabolomic specific um, analyses. And so this is, peptide data, you have way larger numbers of counts. But if we were doing with metabolomics, these would be a lot smaller and you'd want to be a lot more thought, you'd want to be more thoughtful about how you were filtering. I've had data sets with only like 80 metabolites. And so in the in that case, the first four samples had those 80 metabolites. So we were okay filtering on, on any of those levels. So, so maybe I, Lisa can provide a better answer. Yeah. I, I don't know if, uh, G, if you're asking about 
low counts in the sense of like sparsely observed across samples or low counts in meaning there just aren't very many counts observed per sample but might be observed consistently um so i will say that I like said the second case, yeah. So um, we don't explicitly remove things that are very low in abundance like in transcriptomics, but because things that are of lower abundance tend to go missing more often than things of higher abundance, when we do this biomolecule filter that David is showing, um, we are also sort of implicitly removing more low abundant things than high abundant things, if that makes sense. So um, it's sort of a backhanded way of saying, yes, we kind of do the same thing, but we don't explicitly look at abundances and filter based on that alone. Any other questions there, Rachel? We've got a question on massive proteomics and knowing the role of filters when, rather than the protein of interest for remodeling, let's see, I will read the question. In specific to proteomics, massive proteomics data may be much imperative rather than of protein of interest for remodeling of biochemical pathways in multiomics. In this context, may I know the role of filters? So. Potentially, that might be um, metaproteomic data. I think we do tend to apply filters in that context as well, in my understanding. We, we don't differentiate too much, but I do think it depends on the data set. Right, and, and David mentioned metaproteomics and the, the specific proteomics filters and that in that context, we may not want to filter out degenerate peptides because that could filter out most of your data. So it does kind of depend on the context, but um, we still do use filters for the different types of data. Because the end goal here, uh, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, is still to understand the differential expression between treatment groups, not like between organisms. So that's possible. The amount of data you're going to have per organism is going to be pretty low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're interested in like whole characterization, like pretty common in PNNL with soil samples. Uh, another question in the chat relevant to this is like, would there be a good sanity check for filters you should apply and shouldn't apply? I, I feel as a general whole, a lot of the plots that PMRDR does is, is good sanity checks here, as I showed in this example here, um, where we've got ourselves a nice distribution and we've got ourselves a not so nice distribution. So you can increase your own personal confidence in applying this filter. It's also on a per experiment, per data set um, analysis. That's why there's not like an end to end pipeline that automatically chooses all these filters for you. As Lisa says, you can always make friends with the statistician. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm going to pass on to Kelly unless there's any other pressing questions here. Okay. I did see a question um, about whether there are parts of this that are specific or a separate talk specific to metabolomics and the Answer is no. Um, almost all of this that we're talking about today is applicable to proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, um, with the exception of 
like the peptide and protein filters here, um, or when we talk a little bit later on today about rolling up from a, the peptide level to the protein level. So unless we're talking, we may say peptide uh, when we're describing like the coefficient of variation filter, for instance, but that it's applicable to peptides or metabolites or lipids, um, unless it's like specifically degenerate peptides or something like that. So hopefully that helps. So now that we've gone through different biomolecule filters, I'm going to talk some about sample filters and why we might want to filter out samples um, and how, how we can do that objectively um, or as objectively as possible, because there are still some subjective choices that need to be made. Um, but sort of the the basic idea is that some of the samples in our data set might be outliers and that could be due to something in the sample handling processing instrument runs um, where the data that we have for that sample is just it's not representative of the group it belongs to and so the question is, how do we identify those samples so that we can remove them from the data before we get to making statistical comparisons? And so here, what I'm showing um, on the left are box plots from an experiment with three different groups, um, just like we've seen the other box plots before. And there is an algorithm that is cited here at the bottom that can help objectively identify potential sample outliers in our data set. So what this algorithm does is for each sample, so you can look at an individual box plot and take those log to abundance values for that sample and you can compute a median absolute deviation or MAD. You can compute the skewness, kurtosis, the correlation um, of that sample to the other samples in its group. And then for each sample, you can also calculate the percent missing. And those metrics or a subset of those five metrics can be used to calculate a distance between the different samples. So this plot on the right shows for each sample um, the log to robust Mahalanobis distance measure that this algorithm computes. And um, the colors, unfortunately, between the two plots don't correspond to one another, although they are the same samples um, in the same order. So the red box plots correspond to the blue points. Um, but this, <clears throat> this distance measure can be mapped to a p-value. So the horizontal line in this plot is a p-value threshold of 0 0.001. And any samples that fall above that line are considered potential outliers. So we don't just, just go, okay, great, that's an outlier, remove it. We, we do a little bit more um, to verify that it is indeed an outlier. And I'll show you what we look at um, in addition to this particular type of plot. I do think I'll pause here in case there are questions about this because I anticipate this is a new, a new uh, method for folks. Rachel, are there any questions about this? Yeah, we just got one. When you com complete the RMD filter, do you look at different aspects of the data for metabolomics versus proteomics, et cetera? Great question. Um, yes. So we typically um, look at four of these metrics for proteomics, not, not the kurtosis. Um, and then for metabolomics, we reduce that down to three. We take out the percent missing just because there typically isn't that much missing data, if any, in the metabolomics and same for lipidomics data that we see. So it doesn't make sense to include that metric because it won't differentiate the groups. Okay, 
There's a second question. This RMD filter is assessed nation is assessing a combination of all features in a sample and to clarify meaning some combination of all compounds detected in a sample. So it the different metrics that are listed here on this slide are computed on all of the observed peptides or metabolites in that sample. So the percent missing um, just sort of as the easiest example um, would be calculated. So if you have 100 metabolites observed in your sample and you were using percent missing, I know I said we wouldn't for metabolites, but um, if you had five me metabolites that were missing values for that sample, then your percent missing would be 5%. So you're using the whole, um, if you go back to thinking about that spreadsheet, right? And a column is a sample, you're using that whole column to compute these metrics. All right. Um, we have another question here. We're comparing this to clustering albums. Will the results of outlier be different if we use a clustering algorithm, say k-mean stendogram on the pairwise distance matrix? And I think there's a question here about PCA as well. How so, does it compare to those me methods? Um, we use we use PCA and some other methods as sort of complementary analyses to this one to help us. Um, make sure that we're confident that something is or is not an outlier. Uh, because sometimes we'll see a sample like this one um, from the RMD filter, and it says, oh, it's a potential outlier. But as we sort of look at some of these complementary analyses, we see that it, it's really not an egregious outlier. Um, and I think if I go to the next slide, that'll help too. Um, um, can I chime in really quickly? Yes, absolutely. So I would say that clustering methods, hierarchical clustering, all of kind of the things that are mentioned, PCA, are all based on covariance or correlation. Fundamentally, covariance is correlation. And that is one of the metrics that goes into RMD. So, um, so you may get similar results, but you may not flag everything that could potentially be flagged as an outlier using those methods compared to what Kelly is presenting here. And part of the reason that we look at things like the percent missing, the skewness really tells you like how symmetric is your distribution. Kurtosis talks about how heavy are your tails and the, the median absolute deviation. All of those metrics can be indicative of like a, a poor run off of the instrument. Uh, which may or may not be something you would catch just with kind of these other methods that were mentioned in the question. So one of the things that we always do if something gets flagged, um, as in this plot on the right as a potential outlier, is we look at box plots like these. So this plot on the left corresponds to our example from the previous slide. And each of these box plots shows the distribution for the four metrics that were used. So um, we have the median absolute deviation, then skewness, correlation, and proportion, proportion missing. And on the box plots, the sample that's called out um, by name and with the little X there is that sample that was flagged as an outlier or as a potential outlier. So you can see where that particular sample's value is in the distribution of all the samples. So this particular sample kind of stands out from the rest in terms of its correlation. Oh, nope, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. In terms of its skewness and its proportion missing. So it actually has less missing data than the rest of the samples. Um, and then its skewness is on the lower end, um, but not anything that's overly concerning. Um, I also included the plot on the right from a different, a different study, a different sample. Um, the same four metrics were used. And on this plot, you can see that this infection eight sample stands out on kind of three of the different metrics that were used. 
this one has lower correlation than the rest of the samples, but it's also really important to look at the values that are on the y axis of these plots because the correlation here is ranging from about 0.9 to 0.95 those are all really high correlation values so. Um, if that was going from 0.6 to 0.95 that would mean something very different to us. Um, and then the sample also has more missing values than the rest in this particular study. Another part of helping us identify whether something is indeed an outlier um, are these box plots that we've been looking at. So if you see box plots like the ones on the left where I'm pointing out that one sample that's box is much lower than the others, that can be an indicator that something went wrong or something happened during the instrument run or with the previous handling of the sample. Um, you can also see box plots like the ones on the right where there's just sort of a lot of variability and there's nothing that looks very systematic or um, no, no one sample that stands out in a different way from the rest. But these can help if that you're consistently seeing the same sample um, being flagged from these various plots, then you can feel more and more confident that that sample is an outlier and should be removed. Correlation heat maps are another way um, that we can identify outliers. And another thing that we just always look at as part of our exploratory data analysis. And <clears throat> again, I'm showing an example on the left where you see something, a sample, um, that stripe is one sample that has lower correlation with all the other samples. Um, and I wanna mention too that the correlation here is between, it's all pairwise correlations, all the samples. Whereas in the RMD filter, that was just the correlations with the samples in the same group. So you'll often see very similar patterns, but you also get differences. So you can see a different scale of correlations um, when you look at this plot versus the one for the RMD filter. The, the heat map on the right here um, these first three samples are from a mock group, and then the remaining samples are from the treatment group. So we often will see sort of these blocks of correlations where you can differentiate the sample groups. And that, that's not surprising either, unless there's something about the particular groups where you would expect them to be more similar to each other than is showing up in the correlation heat map. We also um, use principal components analysis when we're doing exploratory data analysis and to help us identify outliers. And if you don't have missing data, then the standard matrix decomposition methods work, work fine. But if there is missing data, then you have to um, use a different type of algorithm to do a PCA. So, part of the PMAR R package accounts for this so that we are using a method that's appropriate and robust to missing data. Um, this example plot here is, it shows there's quite a bit of separation between the two treatment groups. This is from that same study with the mock, the three mock samples. And then I think there's nine infection infected samples. Um, it's also really important on the PCA plots to look at the R squared value so that, well, this tells you how much of the variability is explained by this component. And then same thing here. So if these values are lower then less of the variability is being explained and um, that will impact how you interpret whether something might or might not be an outlier just to give some more examples um, of how we might interpret these plots. So the plot on the right, um, I think David has referred to this as a funfetti plot. Everything's kind of evenly sprinkled about the PCA plot. So it's not really 
pointing to any samples as being potential outliers. Um, the plot on the left, there's a lot more groups here, um, but you can kind of see where you've got this group for time zero. Most of them are over here, but you do have this lone red dot over here. So if that particular sample were standing out in some of our other exploratory plots and in our RMD filter, then that would this would add to the evidence that the sample was an outlier and should be removed. And then the last thing I'll talk about before we take a pause for questions um, are some missing data plots. So in particular for proteomics data where there is a lot of missing data, um, these plots are really useful and they're, they can also be used for metabolomics or lipidomics data just to identify maybe something really strange happened with a sample and you'll get like no missing values for everything else but this one sample. Um, so it can help identify things like that um, that you might not be able to see from box plots as well. Um, but we typically look at missing values in two different ways. So on the left, we're looking at the number of missing values by sample. So it's also been colored by group. So you can see if there's anything sort of systematic about missingness by group. Um, and then on the right hand plot, we're looking at the number of missing values per molecule on the y axis and the uh, the mean intensity log two intensity on the x axis so this plot is similar to um one of the plots from the very beginning with sort of the dark cloud of points um where we talked about missingness but you can see that there, there is some relationship between the amount of missing data and the intensity. So for these lower intensity values, you have more missing values per molecule. Um, and then when you have the higher intensity, you tend to have fewer missing values per molecule. So I will pause here for questions before moving on to normalization. Yeah, there was actually a probably leading question. At what point in this workflow would you deal with the removal of potential batch effects? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think normaliz normalization might help with. Yes. And then we were asking when we have replicates from two different groups, how do we ensure that the two data sets are filtered in the same way? So I may need some clarification on that. Um, so to me, replicates, if I'm thinking about an experiment and I have two groups, I might have five replicates, like biological replicates from one group and five from another. And I'm not, none of the filtering that we're doing is on like w only one sample. So if we're filtering out biomolecules, we're filtering them out from the entire data set across all the samples. So I guess I'm not I'm not sure if that fully answers the question, but if there's a clarification, I'm happy to work with that. Okay. Yeah, it looks like he's typing in the Discord now. But yeah, I think I think addressing that the filters do work on a global level, even though they're taking into account some factors from the groups and your different filters. We have a question in the Zoom chat here. For box plots, if no sample stands out, how do you resolve that issue? Does it mean that the data cannot be analyzed using the usual methods? It says figure one, the right. This, this one? Um, so if, if nothing is standing out as like odd looking um, in the box plots, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's great. <laughs> um, 
and you can have you can have sort of you know you could have box plots like this i mean we do have box plots like this right but we're still getting a potential outlier from the rmd filter so we don't just look at one of these things that's why we've got the suite of plots that we're examining to determine whether something's an outlier because just looking at one of them in isolation isn't going to tell you the full story should be mentioned too that all of these metrics are relative to all other samples in the data set so let's say that you have correlations that range from 0.93 to 0.96 for all samples and one sample happens to have a correlation average correlation of like 0 0.90 so it's like marginally less than the others because that distribution is already so like looks so good relative to the other samples it may get flagged by this algorithm even though we're not worried about you know samples that all have correlations of 0.9 or greater so it's it's important to keep in mind that all of these metrics are sort of relative it's possible that your distribution of all these metrics across all samples are actually all like well within a reasonable range and really tightly grouped but you know one of them that happens to be on the extreme of these good values may may get flagged and that's why we are looking at these downstream metrics so that you can look and say well I mean, sometimes we'll see things that get flagged that because they have a lower median absolute deviation and it's because they're all pretty tightly grouped so the algorithm's not perfect that's why we don't apply it just blanket out of the box mm -hmm. yeah and this plot on the right i think is a good example of what Luce is talking about where the the range of values for each of those metrics is pretty narrow so even though this sample is standing out on sort of the the extremes of three of them those values by themselves are really not that extreme all right we have a couple more questions in the discord we got some clarification on the different test groups so if we're if we're thinking about if there might be inherent differences between the two testing groups that we're looking at is it valid to use the same filtering thresholds on the these different groups? Are we dealing with intra-testing group variants versus inter-testing group variants? As to filters, back to the filter question. So the, the samples from the two different treatment groups are in the same data set, and these filters are operating at sort of the data set level. So you wouldn't filter samples from one group differently from samples from another, or the, the biomolecules observed in those samples any differently. All right, last question from the Discord. Uh, the PCA assumes the normal distribution of the data. Do we need to test the normality of the data before performing PCA? And what if they are not normally distributed? So this kind of gets back to um, what David was talking about with the log transform. And we start out before doing a log transformation, we have a very skewed distribution. And that log transformation, whether it's a log two, a log 10, a natural log, um, will get us a lot closer to normality. So we don't often test for normality before doing a PCA. Um, we're we're counting on that log transformation to to get us close enough. I think I answered this to someone else in the discord as well. Um, normality is important in that, it, say, you put sequence data into PCA, you are for sure violating normality. You're going to have lots of zeros. Things are going to be very skewed when you log transform the types of omics data that we're talking about here, you are in the realm of reasonableness for normality. And these methods are fairly robust. Like if you take an, if you take some introductory stats classes, they will tell you that the normality assumption is the thing that um, is sort of 
the tests are most robust to holding up to. So even if you don't formally pass a normality check, as long as you're in the realm of reasonableness, it will likely be fine, which is why we don't test for it. But when you sort of egregiously violate this assumption by putting in things like count data or not log transform data, that's when you really have to worry. All right, our last topic for this talk is normalization. So what we mean by normalization is putting these relative quantities that we have from the mass spec onto comparable scales from sample to sample so that we can do these downstream statistical comparisons that are what we're, what we're driving at here. And so normalization to us is the process of removing or trying to remove the unwanted or unintended variability in our data that can come from the sample processing, storage, um, just from properties inherent to the instrument instruments or the variability in instrumentation. Um, I mentioned here, if different machines or the same machine over time, um, kind of to get at the question that we had about um, batch effects, so if you have more samples than you can run at a given time in a single batch, then you might be trying to run them sort of back to back, or maybe you're collecting samples over time. So you have these batches of samples run over months or years. Um, normalization and additional batch correction um, methods are needed to, to do this, to get the samples so that they're on a comparable scale to make the comparisons that we're, we're aiming to, to learn from. And the, uh, the fun part about normalization is that no one method works all the time um, or for all types of experiments. Um, for proteomics in particular, it's been shown that the amount of protein in doesn't necessarily equal the amount of protein out, the amount that's measured um, by the instruments. And we use scaling factors for our normalization. And those, those may or may not be affected by biological groups in the data. And these plots here at the bottom are meant to to demonstrate that you can introduce or remove statistical significance depending on the normalization approach that you apply to your data. So the box plots on the bottom show the log 10 abundance values for samples in four different groups. And this is before normalization. And then the box plots on the right-hand side um, show the same box plots, but after two different normalization approaches have been applied to the data. And one of the comparisons that was done for this experiment was comparing the second box plot, that RWLPS, back to the first box plot, RWSC. And for that top right set of plots, the p-value for that comparison was highly significant, 0 0.005. And for the data that was normalized in a different way, that same comparison resulted in a p-value that was not significant. So the choice of normalization algorithm can have a big impact on conclusions that you might draw from your data. Um, and we'll talk shortly here about some ways to help choose an appropriate normalization, but before we get to that, I just wanted to give an example of um, what normalization might look like. So a normalization method often consists of both a subset function and a mathematical function. So the subset function says, which peptides or metabolites am I going to use to compute a median or mean, say, to get my normalization factors. So this toy example here has six peptides in it. And if we look at this first sample S1, um, the mean of that sample 
across all those six peptides is 14.83 and the median is 15. So if we use all peptides and compute the mean or the median, those values are the normalization factors that we would get for that particular sample. So if we take just that sample and want to normalize it, when we're on the log scale, what that means is subtracting the normalization factor from that value. So if we're using the global median to normalize, we're using the median of all six peptides in this data set for this sample, then our normalization factor is 15. So in this middle uh, grid here, we're just subtracting 15 from each of those values for the six peptides. And then the result is this matrix on the far right where we have our normalized values. In this case, they range from negative one to one. Um, I just picked very simple examples for the purpose of illustration. Um, and I will also say that sometimes um, we do what we call a back transformation so that we don't have these negative abundance values. Um, it looks kind of weird if you're looking at box plots and everything's shifted so that you're like, oh, how do I have a negative 15 in my plot for abundance? Um, so we have we have ways to bring those back up so that they're on the original scale of the log transformed data as well. Um, so for proteomics data, where we have a lot of peptides, a lot of biomolecules, there is a method called SPANS, and this is intended to help, um, help select a normalization approach that doesn't introduce bias into the data. And the general idea behind SPANS is that any peptides or proteins um, that are very significant for a comparison before normalization, so using the raw data, should remain very significant for that same comparison after normalization. And similarly, any peptides or proteins that are very not significant, so they have p-values that are really close to one or 0.9, say, um, that are not significant for a comparison before normal normalization should remain very not significant for that comparison after normalization. So that's sort of the assumption underlying spans. And what it does is it takes a bunch of different um, subset methods and a bunch of different normalization um, or mathematical functions, and it applies them to the data. And what you get out are scores, and this heat map is showing the scores for the different combinations of subsets and mathematical functions. And the yellow, the yellow um, normalization approaches have the highest scores and they're indicated by dots on this particular plot. So this is showing that if you pick the normalization methods associated with one of these three dots, then you are going to be introducing the least bias into your data. So that is great for proteomics data because we have enough biomolecules to apply this algorithm. For metabolomics or even lipidomics data where we have hundreds of biomolecules instead of thousands, we can't use spans, but we can compute our normalization factors and then use a Kruskal-Wallis test to see whether they are different by group. And if they're not, then, then that's great. And we can apply that normalization method. So these plots um, illustrate for a particular experiment. Um, so on the left, you see the box plots of the data. This is prior to normalization. And in those sort of red boxed Xs on there, you can see that the location parameters, those normalization factors, in this case, medians. So they align perfectly with that horizontal line in the middle of the boxes. Um, those are shown on top of the box plots. And then on the right, um, well, first at the top here, um, we have the p-value from that test. So this is not significant, which is what we were hoping for, because that means that those medians are not significantly different by group. Um, so we can apply that normalization approach and we get this plot on the right-hand side. 
where now you can see we have all of our medians at zero, are at zero because we've subtracted the median of each sample from the values in that sample. Um, and so that's that's how we typically approach the metabolomics and lipidomics data. And I think at this point, I'm going to pause since we've got five minutes left. I want to make sure we can get to questions. All right, there's a question in the chat, um, Discord. Some metabolomics data sets are typically thousands to several thousands. Would they be viable options for spans? Yes. Yeah, yeah, once you get into the thousands, then yes. Good question. All right. Another question for your normalizations. Do you have the means to apply a TIC normalization with normalized global? <laughs> um, that's not currently a part of the PMART R package, but I know that's on our list of things that we're looking at um, going forward. We have several people typing. <laughs> Great. Okay, how do you keep track of all the transformations that have been applied? Does PMRDR keep track of it as a report that is generated with all the transformations employed? <laughs> yes, it does. Um, so yeah, there are um, sort of properties of the data objects that are tracked. I, I won't get much into it, but yes, um, there are built in things to PMART R that will keep track of what you've done to your data, whether it's filters, transformations, normalization, and that sort of thing. All right, next question. We have, what is your opinion of quantile normalization? It's, well, it's not our usual go-to for uh, proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics. Um, although I will say that we have used it before. I, I'm not going to explain this slide in much detail because we're running out of time here, but we had an example a while ago where sort of the usual normalizations that we would apply didn't work and the thing that ended up working was quantile normalization. So. Awesome. All right, next question. For tissue metabolomics, there's often a range of starting tissue weights depending on sample availability. Do you not incorporate this level of normalization until much later? And how does this work with log two transformations? So Lisa, do you have any, any thoughts on this? I don't think I've actually worked with tissue samples uh, and had to do this. I I have not either, uh, but what I will say is typically the when we are looking at like some of the normalization methods that Kelly has presented here, um, the the fact that you're getting relative abundances from sort of the the proteomics and metabolomics, typically these normalization methods kind of get rid of any effects that might be uh, due to that, unless this is some data that I've like never ever seen before. So it's possible that you would want to potentially look at after you've like say applied a, one of these normalizations that Kelly mentioned, you may want to still look to see if like things like your median or your box plus if you see any pattern in those that like makes it apparent that the weight of your or the amount of tissue that you were able to use, there still is some effect there, but I'd be willing to wager that these methods will likely wipe that effect out. Awesome. I think we're getting close to that 10 o'clock time. So there's one more question I think we can take if you guys want. Have you guys considered surrogate variable analysis for modeling significant batch effects? Any plans to add this to PMARDAR or opinions? on this method? 
I don't have a, sorry, Kelly, unless you want to no, go for it. it. Okay. I'm writing this down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a, an opinion at this exact moment. We, um, looking at batch effects, we have two active projects, one on the proteomics front, one on the small molecules front right now, where we're sort of doing an extensive investigation of um, existing batch correction methods. And so we do have plans of incorporating methods into PMART, um, but we're probably, you know, six months or more out from that until we've concluded our investigation. So, um, Anyone who's wanting to point us to particular examples of data and the methods that they're that they are interested in and want follow up opinions, uh, we are actively doing these investigations and would be happy to correspond with you um, after we've kind of formed an opinion so it's a great question and it's a big issue. Yeah.